you have. And then we are recording this webinar and this will be emailed out to all registered attendees within a week. We are super excited to get this going, but first I also wanted to share some exciting news. Um, for those of you that are attending, we're gonna be doing a random drawing at the end of the webinar for a $100 Amazon gift card. So please stay tuned until the end um, for your chance to win. And without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and hand this over to Josh Burson. Thank you, Abby. And I hope to make this worth your time hanging around here listening, even though you have to wait to the end to find out about the Amazon gift certificate. <clears throat> what I'm gonna talk about for the next um, 40 or 45 minutes is the interesting problem we have in most companies of finding people and the issue of build versus buy. And in the talent acquisition and recruiting market, it's unusual for people to think about it this way, but this is a very common way to think about almost everything else you acquire inside of a company. And so um, in this particular world, in this particular economy, it's a really important dialogue to have about recruiting. And so I'm gonna take you through sort of how, how this concept works and give you some ideas on how it can improve your organizational performance. So first I wanna talk a little bit about um, the, um, the world of work and why recruiting and talent acquisition has become so difficult. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for this, but one of which, the one that's most on most people's minds is the accelerated speed of adoption of technology and the rapid pace of automation. And most of us, when I, at least at people in my age, when I think about automation, I think about robots, I think about factories, but actually it's automation of everything, automation of customer service, automation of financial transactions, automation of analytics, automation of uh, reporting, uh, people that do financial analysis, that do actuary work, uh, that do customer service. Um, there are chatbots that do that better and better all the time. Uh, there are now systems available from companies like IBM that will actually um, listen to customer inquiries and answer based on a database. Uh, they have a net promoter score in the, in the high 40s and 50s, so they're very highly used. And this is changing the nature of work and the changing of the nature of jobs and turning companies into more and more of a service organization. An interesting thing about automation is the more we automate, the more the people, the, the more important the people become, because what happens is most of the routine work that what we used to consider manual labor is being done by software or machines, leaving the human labor to be greater. And an indication of that is the growth in the service economy and the nature of um, basically company valuations. If you look at data on the valuation of the US stock market, 85% of the valuation of United States corporations is intangible assets. Intangible assets, are things we don't know what they are. Uh, it's IP brand services, it's not cash, it's not you know raw material, it's not oil on the ground, it's not inventories. It's, it's things made by people, including software, and that, and that is really more and more what work is about. Now that's a good thing for people, but it's also not necessarily a good thing for hiring because it makes the jobs more human oriented and more multifaceted and hybrid. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute, but it's also made it very hard to attract people. In the conference board CEO study that came out just this last month, and this was around 600 CEOs, <clears throat> maybe more. The number one internal issue companies now say is state is attracting and retaining talent. Um, very closely followed by um, assessing the performance of people. Um, and the reason that performance assessment is so high is that in a market of very high skills requirement where we're recruiting very heavily, we really wanna make sure we have the right people and the right jobs because it's so hard to find them. Um, and this problem is getting a little bit worse because we haven't been doing a very good job of improving productivity at work. Um, Productivity is the measure of output per hour worked or output per dollar of labor. And economists have been writing about this for several years now that despite all of the technology we have, the iPhone, Twitter, you know, Alexa, um, AI, 
robotics and the machines. Uh, soon we'll have drive self-driving cars, I suppose. But um, the number of hours worked is going up, but the output is not going up at the same rate. In fact, you know, if you look at most of the data on, uh, you know, the world of work and well-being, people are working more hours, they're under more stress, um, and part of the reason for that is productivity hasn't kept up with technology. In fact, you know, one of the interesting statistics, you know, that the conference board economists concluded, and I think it's a very interesting conclusion that makes you think about this issue of recruiting, is that we're running out of people. Believe it or not, it sounds very strange, and you know, because we have a lot, we have an unemployed, we're basically at full employment in the United States. Um, there is what it, we, we now have um, a 15% voluntary turnover rate in the United States. One, almost one out of six people will voluntarily leave your job every year for another job because they think it's better. There's so many jobs. Now there's cities, there's absolutely not true everywhere. There's people that are underskilled. There's people in cities where the jobs are the wrong jobs for them. There's talent and job mobility problems in the workforce. But we're, we're getting pretty much at the limit of how many people we can hire. And at the same time that's happening, the fertility rate is dropped. In the US, it's below replacement. In the UK, it's below replacement. In Germany, in Japan, in the Nordic countries, the only place where the birth rate is high is India, China, and Africa, and the, developed, the developing economies, which are, you know, great. Um, there's great people obviously being born in those countries too, but they don't have the same education and we don't always have the business opportunity for them. So they're either going to have to move, which gets into the issue of migration, um, or we're going to have to make more out of who we have. And basically the conclusion that the conference board people came to is that the only way companies will grow in a labor market like this is not by hiring more people, but by making people more productive improving what they call the quality of labor. The quality of labor means skills. So as you'll see in a few minutes, you can reskill and redeploy somebody inside your company at a lower cost in many cases than you can hiring them from the outside in this kind of a market. And this is, this is what one of my friends calls an upside down market. It's upside down in the sense that um, in many, many areas of work, there are far fewer people than there are jobs. And so we have to sort of bend over backwards and find new ways of filling those holes. One of the ways is also to look at older people. And this is a little bit of a new idea that's starting to pick up that if you really look at the demographics of the workforce in the US, the UK, and the most of the developed economies, the fastest growing segment is people over the age of 50. It's not the millennials. The millennials are in the workforce now, but their cohort is smaller than the boomer cohort and the boomers are living longer. So people my age, I'm 62, people my age are now living well into their 80s and 90s and hundreds. And certainly the next generation will, will live well beyond that. And so our careers are elongated and we have not set up the right talent management strategies or talent practices to accommodate this, what I call tenured workforce. So that's another opportunity for a build versus buy decision. Unfortunately, what the data now shows is that most companies are biased against older workers. And a lot of studies have shown, particularly here where I live in San Francisco, that if you're over the age of 40 or 50, uh, you're gonna have a hard time competing with young people. In fact, a really sort of sad piece of research came out that said that most uh, very high percentage of people that lose their jobs in their 50s and 60s will never ever make as much money as they did when they lost that job because it is so hard to get a new position. I, I think that's a, a problem. I think if you're an employer or an HR person, that's an opportunity for you. And uh, I give you an example of this, General Motors now has a program, it's been written about in the press and I've met the people who work on it called Take Two, where they're, bring, they're inviting back engineers who retired to come back to GM at you know slightly lower salaries than they left, but they get to go back and have great jobs and go back to work and they retrain them and reskill them to go back into the GM um, engineering organization. 
I, I see no reason why more companies can't do that. That's going to be one of the things that I think you're going to have to think about in the next couple of years as the labor market continues to change. And then the other factor that you know makes this even more complicated is this idea of the alternative workforce. And it's a you know my tagline on this is the alternative workforce just isn't alternative anymore. It is the workforce. Um, look at some of the data on this chart. Based on data from ADP, in the last 19 years, and I don't know, I bet the U.S. has added 50 million uh, sort of citizens in the last nine, 20 years, maybe more than that. The number of W-2s has gone down by 4%. <clears throat> so the number of full-time salaried workers is declining and the number of 1099s is skyrocketing. Um, the U.S. Labor Department has not done a good study on this for many, many years. So there's all sorts of anecdotal and different data out there. But if you look at the data that I've dug up, it's pretty clear that 40 to 50, for probably mo probably 50%, but the data that most late is in the 40s, somewhere around 40 to 45% of the actual work being done <clears throat> in the United States, and I'll just refer to the United States now, it's I think even greater in other countries, is done by people who are not full-time employees. And there's different categories of them. We're actually writing a big report with HRPS where we'll clear, clarify the categories for you. But they're contractors, they're contingent, they're gig workers, they're people that work in uh, talent networks, um, very highly skilled people. I mean, I happen to be one of them right now and I'm having no problems finding work. It's a little bit of a different world than when you're a full-time employee, but I've you know, kind of done this before. Um, and, in, and an indication of how big this is, is the growth of companies like WeWork. And I'm not here to tell you anything about WeWork as a business, but it's exploding with growth. And if you've ever gone to a WeWork and just wander around and see how many people are in there, you'll get a sense of how big the alternative workforce has become. This is a huge, opportunity for you as an employer to tap into a labor market that is not what you know not necessarily completely under your thumb but still very capable of being managed similar to before um, and at the same time that's going on the people you have in your company are also getting concerned um, this is data that just came out in January from so it's last month from Edelman it's a global study they do on trust and I read it every year because it's very, very interesting how it's changing year over year. Right now, people are really worried about their jobs. Um, we have all this, you know, angry discussion about income inequality, uh, the political, you know, sort of mess in the United States. Uh, people want a job that helps them grow. Um, and that, this is 59% of people. So it's not just white collar workers, everybody. Um, because there's this sense of sort of impending doom that people have that if this job goes away, whatever the job is, how am I going to find another one? Am I skilled? Am I ready for the next position? Am I ready to use technology in a more uh, facilitated way if my next employer requires me to do something new? So, um, so this sense of skills anxiety is affecting the people inside the company, again, driving you towards a build versus buy decision. And um, if you look at the data from LinkedIn, they've chronicled this in great detail. Um, LinkedIn has a report that comes out once a year, actually I think it comes out quarterly, on the most in-demand workplaces, work, uh, work locations. And you can look at the cities in the United States and now they have around the world and where skills are in high demand and what skills are in demand. And, you know, the one that happens to be the highest in-demand city at the moment is the San Francisco Bay Area where I live. <clears throat> and, you know, the number one most in-demand job is machine learning engineer, which is a job that didn't even exist two years ago. It's 9.8 times more in-demand than average. But if you start filtering down this, what you see is actually the soft skills, sales, customer service, uh, brand marketing, personal loan consultant, um, healthcare service jobs are just as much in demand. And actually, when LinkedIn published this report, they did some analysis and data science on the relative, uh, you know, acuteness of these different skills. And the number one skill in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is in demand, is not technology. It's oral communications. It's ability to 
work with other people, talk, communicate, listen. And, and those are those are part of our learning experience too. And and so you know your ability to deliver um, continuous education to your employees is now essential to your ability to hire and your ability to grow. And by the way, it isn't technical skills. And this is a this is a really interesting chart. It's a little bit hard to read, but let me explain it to you. Because um, I, I go through this stuff all the time. The vertical axis here is wages. Wage growth over the last 30 years or so. And they grouped all the different jobs. There's hundreds and hundreds of jobs categories in the ONET database. The ONET database is the database of it's one of the biggest databases of job descriptions and job titles and job families. And they grouped them into four types. Jobs that are low social, low math. A low social, low math is probably like you know hammering together uh, boards where you're kind of not really working with other people and you don't really aren't using your technical skills very much, but you have, it's sort of manual labor. Um, low social, high math, which is the green line, which would be like a financial analyst who works by themselves. Um, high social, high math, uh, or high social, low math might be a salesperson, customer service, uh, healthcare worker, where you're not you know, necessarily manipulating numbers all day, but you're doing a lot of work with other people. And then high social, high math might be a product manager or a designer. And you can see that um, zeroing back to 1980, there's a steady increase in high social, high math. And the green one, which is the high math, low social, is actually declined. And this is something that you know I've experienced in my life because I used to be an engineer. If, you, if you're an engineer and you get out of college, you, you have a great career for at least the first 10 years. But if you don't move into management or product management or marketing or um, some more hybrid role, your earnings plateaus. Uh, it doesn't keep going up like it does in these other roles because the human, what are called hybrid skills, are the ones that are most badly needed as we automate. And, and everything does get automated. I mean, even if you're a software engineer, you know, if you learned COBOL in the 1980s, COBOL is not, not the thing anymore. You have to you know, transfer your skills to something else. Um, and people know this. This is not you know, unknown. Um, one of the studies that I did last fall with LinkedIn's help was we had 2,800 professionals describe, uh, you know, I'll ask them a whole bunch of questions, but one of the questions was, you know, what would make you look for a new job? And it's interesting, the number one issue is inability to learn and grow. Number two is productivity in the work environment. Um, raise was really not as high, money. So, um, you know, this is a an essential part of running a business today and something you have to do um, and you can do it in amazing new ways. I won't spend a lot of time on L&D right now because that's another topic, but the L&D profession has really revolutionized itself. There's training content everywhere. There's new platforms, new tools. You don't have to buy a big complicated LMS to do this. And, and we've changed the nature of the L&D department and the L&D um, profession to be more strategic, to help people learn on a regular basis. And, and so what I like to you know, remind people is that in today's world, in this particular talent market where we are in 2019, you really have to be doing reskilling all the time. You need to be giving people in their current jobs opportunities to upskill. An example on the left is a software engineer maybe re, you know, relearning or learning new um, tools to do the job they're already in. Reskilling, where people who used to use COBOL now do client server or mobile or cloud or cybersecurity or reinvent where your job may be going away. And, you know, the more sophisticated companies that are outperforming others are giving their employees information to reinvent themselves so that they can reinvent themselves inside the company because the cost of hiring them on the outside is very high, as I'll show you later. The third issue that's contributing to this build versus buy topic is the way companies operate. And let me spend a few minutes on this. Um, the, the, you know, the, the 1960s, 1970s books and articles about management were really about leadership from the top. You know, what did Jack Welch do to turn around GE? Um, you know, and if you read the book on GE, and I've read several of them, you know, what, the, what they talk about, and Peter Drucker is, 
is really, you know, um, what leaders need to do to drive behavior and execution in their organizations. Um, as much as important as leaders are important, they're actually not doing the same things they used to do. Today, as you'll see in a minute, companies operate as networks. And this isn't just a good idea, this is happening. Um, we found out in the 2016 Deloitte Human Capital Trends, which was three years ago now, that the number one topic on people's minds as they think about their digital transformation is how they reorganize themselves so people can operate in a more agile way. People are reading up on Agile and Scrum and OKRs, which is a new, um, a new way of thinking about goals, so that they can operate in teams, and they are doing it. And this is research that will be published in a couple of months, but I wanted to share just the numbers. Um, we asked, um, I think it's actually close to 6,000 companies now, um, how they are organized. And what they told us was actually kind of shocking, that only 17% consider themselves to be a hierarchy today. Um, almost a third of them consider themselves to be a network. That's a radical change in three years. And of those companies that have done that and that characterize themselves that way, almost all of them have seen some or significant perform performance improvement. So where we really are is figuring out how to optimize an organization where people work in teams, they facilitate, uh, they grow through um, horizontal mobility, they educate themselves on a regular basis, <clears throat> their value to the organization is largely um, measured by their contribution and their skills, not their level and job title, <clears throat> how much money they're making and how many people report to them, which is the way it's been set up pretty much my whole career. Um, and that mobility, internal mobility, internal development is a part of success. And that has created a new way of thinking about HR. Um, the HR um, function of today has to be one where individuals are on the right are encouraged to express their desires and goals with coaching, with support, with tools. The organization is continuously reevaluating at, at a line level, not at a senior level, at an individual manager and team level, who we need and what jobs, and people are given opportunities to move and develop themselves. And I threw that green circle in there too because more and more of this now is driven by people's sense of purpose. Um, if, you, if you have a sense of mission and purpose in your company and people can express their needs in the context of that purpose, you get sort of an extra boost of um, engagement and performance and energy. And so all of this has to come together. Um, now, before I get into the build versus buy thing, which I'm gonna get into in a minute, um, let me just remind you and sort of explain to you that actually doing this is very complex. Companies that do a good job of internal mobility and reinvention and redevelopment do a lot of things. This is um, my list of things that I have discovered in companies that are good at this, and I'm sure I'm leaving things out. There are some new tools. There's two vendors, Fuel50 and Gloat that have built software for this to try to help people find new jobs and reskill themselves internally. Uh, there's a new set of tools coming out from Instructure to do this, which is a learning technology company. Workday has been working on this. Um, a lot of career management uh, platforms exist, but most of them haven't been designed for this continuous uh, development environment. And we have to do it in the context of productivity because um, if people are not productive, they don't have any time to learn. In fact, it's interesting in the research we did with LinkedIn, we asked, we, we characterize people into people that are redeveloping themselves and people that aren't. The people that are spending a lot of time learning are much, much happier than those that aren't. And the people that aren't spending a lot of time learning basically said the main reason they're not is they don't have any time. So, you know, I don't know whether you blame them or the organization for that, but nevertheless, we have to give people time to learn and give them an experience to learn. And that gets into this issue of the employee experience. And the employee experience is part of your job in HR. Uh, Mark Leedy, who's the one who coined the phrase when he was at Airbnb, 
um, I think, nailed it with this. Um, if we can't give people at work a um, series of designed experiences so that they can go from step to step to step as they progress in their jobs, um, you know, we're, get, we're not helping them in HR. We're getting in their way. And, and that's a complicated um, equation. This is the um, research I did at Deloitte, and I see it's been extended a little bit um, on what it takes to build a great employee experience. And, you know, that some of these things are uh, well known, but, but I think what we found when we did research on this, and this is ongoing research, that the growth opportunity, the orange column in the middle, is the one that is sometimes the most important to young people. If you look at people in their 20s and 30s inside of your company and what gets them excited and what turns them off, I would say growth opportunity is probably number one in most cases. Obviously money is too, but um, so, so you're gonna find that if you're focused on the employee experience and you're not creating a sense of internal development, um, you're not doing it. You're not getting there. Um, and, and that comes out in, in, in employee engagements data too. This is, a this is a look at the latest data from Glassdoor on the relative uh, levels of employee engagement in there. There's about three or 4,000 companies in this data set. And um, employee engagement is a, it's always gonna be a bell curve. It's always gonna be a, um, a problem that you can do better at. And if you look at the companies on the right, in this chart, and this is gonna be more, you'll get more information on this on this book I'm working on. Um, those are companies that create facilitated talent mobility and development internally. So, so, uh, so this issue of development and growth and culture is a lot more important than you think. It's more important than money um, for most people. Once you reach a certain level of pay, um, you know, and people feel like they're fairly paid, giving them more money doesn't really motivate them that much more but giving them career growth, giving them opportunities to um, reinvent themselves does. Okay. Um, and then the final thing I wanna get to, to before I get into the build versus buy thing is the issue of teams. I, I was showing you this, this is from Google. This is, you know, if, if, you, re, if you, you know, consider the fact that your company is operating as a network of teams, what is it that makes a team successful? Um, this is Google's assessment that they've done. Uh, it's all pretty good stuff, can't argue with any of that. But what really comes down to is a sense of belonging. And, um, and people feel that they belong when their skills and con contributions are valued. And let me just run through this chart for you so you get a sense of how important this is. This is a research study that's done every year by some professors at Columbia and some other professors around the world on happiness. And what they do is they ask, um, you know, tens of thousands of people to rate their happiness on a sense, on a um, uh, rate scale of one to 10. So it's like a net promoter score. And then they analyze the data by country and different, different sub, -develop, develop, sub dimensions. And what they found is that there's essentially four issues that um, contribute to happiness, your health, your income, your sense of social relationships, your friends, your family, and your sense of trust. And what they found in this research, and I, I did this analysis myself, that if you compare the United States in 2016 and 2017 to the Nordics, the Nordic countries, uh, we are uh, we have lost, we are less, 5.6% less happiness in the last 10 years. They're 11% more happy. Now, why is that? Uh, we're actually healthier than them. Our health went up by 1.6%. Their health went up by 0.1%. We're making more money than them. Everybody around here feels like they're making all this money because the stock market went up, although I don't think that's everybody is participating in that. The Nordics haven't experienced that. But we've lost social relationships significantly, and we've significantly lost trust in our institutions. And I don't need to talk about that. Anybody who watches the TV or the press knows what's going on there. Um, and one of the conclusions they came to mathematically was that if we wanted to make people as happy in the United States as they are in the Nordics through money, we would have to double the GDP of the United States. 
to counterbalance these negative impacts. So my point is right now in 2019, the most trusted institutions in the world are companies, are businesses. Now, I'm not saying everybody's trusted. We've got plenty of issues with certain companies, but generally speaking, you're sitting on an opportunity to create a sense of trust. And if you allow people to reinvent themselves and to work with their teams, you're gonna get a, a sense of loyalty in your organization, like something you've never seen before. Okay, so given all that, that's all sort of startup context background. How do we how do we sort of deal that do this? Um, so let's talk about um, recruiting. Um, there's been a lot of research done on recruiting, and I've done a fair amount of it, and many many other people have, and it's really complicated. Um, and when we studied recruiting in the last year or two, when I was at Deloitte. Um, and wrote a big report on it, we basically concluded that there's quite a variation in expertise in recruiting. There are a set of companies, and I'll show you the, the uh, maturity model in a minute, that are way ahead of everybody else. And they've been investing in recruiting for a long time. They have very sophisticated technology platforms. They um, are very good at assessment, and they're getting a lot of results. You can see that if you're not good at recruiting, you're gonna get creamed because your competitors are getting better people, they're uh, able to respond faster, they're able to use data better, and they're also able to manage their people better. And when we studied this in 2018, we found that roughly three quarters of the companies are basically just doing the basics. Um, what we used to call spray and pray or post and pray. Create a job description based on some job rec that some manager dreamed up, put it on the website and hire a recruiter to go find people. Now there's a whole bunch of problems with that. And I just explained some of them. The job description that is developed by a line manager, if it isn't uh, uh, broad enough could describe a job that goes away or changes within a period of quarters. So, um, you know, so, so the ability to do level one, level two recruiting, yes, you can fill slots, but do you get the right people that can grow in the company as the company changes? And what we found is that actually only about one in seven or so companies are good at this. And the ones at level four, are able to build personalized experiences for job candidates, very um, uh, extensive uh, models of recruitment and assessment, and they can search and source people in many, many different ways. One of my friends is now running a recruiting company that with some advanced AI, and he's now able to, he's looking for, he's working in the area of recruiting cybersecurity people and, um, um, AI people, because those are areas where there's very, very tight demand. And he found that there's all sorts of factors other than their technical skills that will attract them. Do they want to be part of the team? Uh, is there somebody in the company that they would consider a mentor? Is the geography um, attractive to them? Is the pay attractive? Obviously, is an issue. Um, is the company's brand going to look good on their resume? These are tricky issues that are entering the world of recruiting. And, and what we found in the research is that while all of that is great and all of that is um, hard work and takes uh, effort, and if you look at companies out here in Silicon Valley where the job market is so competitive, 50% or more of their HR department is in recruiting. In fact, in a lot of those companies, it's 60 or 70% of the HR department is in recruiting. They're also good at internal mobility because all of the things that you do to reach level four here are also useful internally. If you know how to assess people strategically, if you know how to plan and understand what the jobs are, if you know how to onboard people, if you know how to, under, to explain people what their career path are gonna be, that's great for internal candidates too. So um, ability to build or mo mobilize internal talent clearly showed up in this data as a best practice. In fact, the people at level four in this model, which are developing, which are delivering significantly higher business outcomes, are also good at internal mobility. They also know how to assess people 
in new and different ways. They don't only look at skills and experiences. <clears throat> yes, I just gave you a big speech on why skills are important, how skills are changing, but that's not everything. Um, people coming out of school, for example, will have great skills in some technical domain, but will they actually perform well on the job where things are changing all the time, there's lots of people to work with, there's um, you know distractions and organizational issues and cultural issues. You don't know that unless you assess people based on their cultural fit, um, their values, their ambition in the job that they're in, their potential over the long term based on the career opportunities you have in your company. If you get somebody who's really, really ambitious, comes out of a Ivy League school, wants to make a lot of money, has very high expectations for growth, but your company is not growing very fast and uh, you're more of a stable, you know, they're not going to be happy there. I mean, you may want to hire that person, but a year or two later, they're going to be gone. So, um, so that's a big part of this. Building a great candidate experience is a big part of this. This is where Goodco, by the way, the company that's sponsoring this webinar, Goodco, I'm going to talk about them in a minute, has been working on this for a decade now and has done an amazing job of assessing these kinds of cultural attributes. When I first met Samar, the founder of Goodco, this is what he was doing. And this was, I think, 10 years ago. So um, there's some amazing technology and tools now you can use to assess people. I'll let um, Luke talk about that in a couple minutes. You have to build a great experience so people actually want to apply for your company. That's not easy. Nobody has time to browse through. I mean, some of the employment websites that big companies have, you can't find a job. It's impossible. There's too much stuff in there. So, uh, so there's new tools from Google and IBM and others that will actually allow a candidate to find the job more quickly. Um, and then you need to build a, a development program for recruiters so that the recruiters themselves know what questions to ask and can reach out and identify and source people in alternative places, including people that might not be willing to work full time, as I showed you earlier, where 45% of the workforce actually is. Um, I had an interesting conversation years ago with the head of recruiting at a large oil company, and he's been around a long time and, you know, he's quite an expert. And in the oil industry at the time, the most critical role was exploration and production engineers. There are, there are apparently only about 7,000 oil and gas exploration and production PhDs in the world, and there's very few new ones. So they run around from company to company making more and more money, and everybody tries to recruit them. So, um, so I was asking him, you know, what have you learned about recruiting and all of the things you do to attract great people? And he said, well, first of all, you know, there's certain roles where we really, really put a lot of time into them, and there's other roles where we're a lot less focused. And he said, but I found that over the many, many years that I've been doing recruiting, the one um, factor that is the most predictive of a high-performing hire and a high-retention hire is the recruiter, is the having a recruiter that knows our business, knows what it likes to work here, knows how people progress, knows what the criteria of success are, um, and can express that and assess people against that. That's a very important job. Um, so developing recruiters and developing the recruiting team is part of this, and is technology. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on recruiting technology. There's a ton of it. But what we found in the maturity model that we did at Deloitte was that <clears throat> the companies at level four were significantly more advanced and significantly more experimental. So if you haven't looked at tools like Goodco, you should. Not all the tools are going to work for all the jobs, but that's okay. This is a complicated problem. Assessing and hiring people is the most important thing you do. It is the number one most important thing you will do in HR. If you're not bringing the right people into the company, nothing else really matters. Um, and these companies are much more, these level four companies are much more involved in, and sophisticated in their technology. So the last thing I want to talk about now was really the title of the whole speech or talk, which is build versus buy. How do you balance the need to recruit versus develop? Now, you know, first of all, I don't need to tell you that recruiting only goes so far. I talked about that earlier. Um, the average time to hire is getting close to 40 days, which is a long time. That means there's a lot of jobs that are open for months 
many months. Um, I don't think the unemployment rate is going to change for a while. I think we're, you know, we may have a recession, but I, I think we're in a job uh, market of many, many new roles. And so we're going to have a hard time hiring for a long time to come. Um, in terms of internal mobility, most companies just aren't very good at it. Um, this is, you know, this bar chart, you know, probably should have been drawn differently, but you, in the research we did, I don't have the citation here, but this was done, this is the Human Capital Trends 2019, which will be published in a couple of months. Um, we asked companies, how well do you move people between teams, between groups? Do you have programs to help? Do you have technology? Do you have a culture? No, none. Very low. I mean, really, really low. 20 to 25% said they're okay at it, but three quarters of them said they're poor. One of the questions we asked companies, uh, asked of respondents on this particular survey was, in a scale of one to 100, how would you rate your company in terms of ease of finding a job inside versus ease of finding a job outside? And 59% of the respondents said, it's easier to find a job outside the company than inside the company. That is an absurdly ridiculous finding. Um, it doesn't surprise me at all, but that's the where we are. In fact, quite a few of the big companies I talked to told me that if you want to get promoted and move to a new role, it's much better to quit and come back in as a new candidate than it is to apply for it internally, because the internal process of applying for and getting a job is so underfunded. So anyway, this has got to change. I don't, I don't need to harp on this. Um, you know, we need better tools to identify people. We need better tools for people to find opportunities. Uh, managers have to be incented to build internal hiring plans and to accommodate internal candidates and develop them. And we need to develop them. And by the way, developing people isn't as hard as you thought it was. There's a belief in many young managers, um, and I've been through this too, that, oh, you know, if I have a new role, I will go find the person who's done this before and it'll be great. The purple squirrel, uh, men, you know, mentality. There's a purple squirrel out there somewhere that is the perfect person for this job. Well, um, maybe, but there's a couple problems with that. Number one, it's going to take you a long time and it's going to be expensive to find that person. Number two, if this purple squirrel exists, they're probably making pretty good money doing a pretty good job where they are. So you're gonna to have to attract them away. Number three, if they do join you, they're, they may not stay because they're so good at whatever it is they do, they might have other opportunities. So I'm not saying there aren't great opportunities to hire, but sometimes it's okay to reskill people. And the staggering results is that reskilling is a lot easier than you think. Now, this is a research report that came out a year ago. I don't think it got nearly enough play because I know the guys who wrote it. <clears throat> it is an absolutely staggering piece of research that is well worth looking through. You can get it online. Um, and they went through, these guys at BCG worked with Burning Glass, and they went through and they looked at dozens and dozens of jobs that were being um, changed by technology. And they looked at the skills required in the old jobs and the new ones. And then they did some studies to figure out how long it would take for people to learn the new skills. And what they found is that 96% of the jobs that are being reinvented by AI and technology have good fit options that take one to 12 to 18 months for people to reinvent themselves. That's not very long. It's not a five year reinvention. In fact, one of the companies that I'm going to visit next week told me that they can take, you know, college kids who studied math have very little experience in software engineering and they can turn them into software engineers in about 12 to 18 months with a boot camp. Um, and you can do this on your own too. I mean, if you're out on the job market looking. So, so, and that's just sort of in the high end, high tech stuff. Office clerk to customer service, executive secretary to training specialist, on a, there's all these opportunities. And if you go to companies that have great internal mobility and great internal development cultures, 
you find amazing things. You find people that started out as the executive secretary that are now running sales. You find out people in healthcare organizations that came in as a nurse practitioner that are now running the whole nursing function. They've moved, people can move into amazing new roles if you're given the opportunity. And it isn't as expensive or difficult as you thought. And I, if you don't believe me, look through this report. They've gone through dozens and dozens of jobs and they describe exactly how it works. So I, I really think the bottom line in all of this is that as you think about how your company is gonna grow, and, and even if you're not growing, if you're hiring people on a regular basis, you need to make a decision in every single case of build access or buy. Buy means we're gonna go hire somebody. We have no one in the company that knows how to do this. It's a very strategic role. The external expertise will be badly needed. We need some outside perspectives. Um, this is a growth business for us. Um, we need somebody who knows how to do it. Okay, great. You're going to have to heavily invest in employment brand, culture and assessment tools. You know, have a great recruiting team and you will find people. And then, you know, there'll be a big challenge of getting them to stay. <coughs> great. The second is access. You know what? We need this job filled. It is a technical job. It is a design job. It is a customer service job. Um, it will have a career of some kind, but we're not as interested in the career right now. Maybe we can find a role or person a team, an outsourced organization who can do this for us, and maybe it isn't a full-time job. On um, all sorts of technical roles, design roles, people who work in the cafeteria, I mean, all sorts of things fall into this role of accessing talent and not bringing them full-time. And the third is, maybe we could get somebody else to move into this position. Now, I've been involved in this. We had this going, this happened at Deloitte a lot, where we were looking for our purple squirrels at Deloitte were the research analysts. Research analyst is a job we created, which is like an impossible job. And uh, you can't do it until you've done it for 10 years. It's like that kind of thing where, you know, it takes a long time to do it well. What we found is that, you know, and then the typical recruiting reaction to a research analyst, let's go find a PhD. Let's find a PhD who's done research before. What I found in that particular case was the PhDs were not good fits for these jobs. There was actually some overlap on the skills needed, but there were all sorts of experiences they needed to have with pragmatic research and consulting that PhDs didn't have and didn't want to have. And so after several years of trying to hire PhDs into these jobs, I stopped doing that. And we more or less moved into a different model where we realized that in most cases when we built, when we hired these kinds of people, we were going to build them as part of the job. So even the people that we hired when I left Deloitte, and I'm talking about my experience at Burson by Deloitte, were people that we knew it would take them two or three years to grow into those jobs. If you're going to have that kind of mentality and you understand that that's true, you're going to find internal people that are just as good as candidates. And building a culture of internal mobility will give you all the benefits I talked about earlier um, and um, a, an opportunity to dramatically reduce the cost. And let me sort of finish the webinar on that. One of the studies that I did with um, a large financial services company, and it's not published yet, so I'm not going to give you the details, is we looked at their ability to hire software engineers versus develop them. And, you know, every, every company is doing this. I mean, there's no, so, there's no company in the world that isn't hiring software engineers somewhere. Um, and, you know, when you're a bank and you're competing with Google or Facebook or some hot software company, you know, software engineers, you know, they may want to work for a bank, but they'd probably rather get the stock options at another company. So not only do they have to pay people a lot of money, they have to um, really heavily recruit them. They have to give them a signing bonus. Um, they have to give them a great work experience, you know, probably redo the offices, give them free lunch, you know, whatever. Um, it's pretty expensive. And they did a study and they found out, and a lot of those people leave after a year or two, um, they found out that it was six times more expensive to hire than it was to build these skills. Now, yes, it might take 12 to 18 months to build the skills, but this particular company now has a digital academy 
that allows them to continuously build those skills. I think given all the data I talked to you about earlier on this webinar, um, this orange box has to be one of the most fundamental strategies you have. And this is where I get to GoodCo. The GoodCo guys, and I'm gonna turn it over to Luke in a minute, have been developing assessment tools that are both skills and culture based for years. And the founder of GoodCo, who I know pretty well, did this because what he found in his own career was that there were all sorts of soft skill related issues that created, um, that contributed to his employment experience that weren't in the typical skills assessments. And so um, my little plug for GoodCo is if you're new to this and you're trying to figure out how to assess people better as they move into one of these three um, moves, whether it's full-time build, buy, or borrow, um, I really would recommend you talk to GoodCo. So anyway, that's kind of the end of the story here. I'm gonna turn it over to Luke and tell you a little bit about Good, GoodCo and then we'll answer any questions that you might have. Thank you guys for your attention. Luke, over to you. Uh, awesome, thanks so much for that uh, amazing webinar, Josh. Lots of great information in there and uh, thanks for, for being such a good friend to GoodCo and for those unsolicited plugs for us. We really appreciate it, those are awesome. Um, just this is going to only take a minute. I also want to thank uh, my team, Abby and Cassandra here. Abby is amazing. She made this webinar run smoothly. She forgot to introduce herself at the <laughs> beginning, so. <laughs> but she's awesome. We have a great team here. Uh, and bef before we get to the, I think we have one question actually, Josh. Do you want to answer that okay. first? Um, I can't see it. So if you, oh, oh here it is. Okay. okay. It's, uh, is there, is there a consideration of the benefits of insurance one? I can just read it for you. Yeah. 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 yeah um, I would say there, this is a this is a really interesting area, um, and I know companies are worried about providing benefits to contractors because it you know so, sort of raise a red flag that you have to pay them full time, but um, I I think you have no choice. I've, the research that we're publishing in the next month or so with HRPS, we actually interviewed a lot of companies and what we found was that if the employee, if the part-time or 10